Well, thank you for joining us. This will be the last class of Creation Science 101. We've only covered about one and one half of my videotape series, which is um, 15 hours long. We've covered what I normally cover in three hours. It's taken us almost 15 hours, or will by the end of this class, to get that far. So uh, hopefully there's been some more uh, information added that will be helpful and useful to you. We left off last week talking about the canopy of water that's above the, or that was above the earth. The Bible teaches in Genesis 1, 6, and 7 that there was a layer of water above the atmosphere. This is called the canopy theory. We've been talking about that the last uh, few hours in here, about the time before the flood when something was different. Probably only a small fraction of the flood water was found in the canopy. Probably most of it was found underneath the crust of the earth. Maybe only six or ten inches of ice or water would be above the atmosphere. It wouldn't take much more than that to filter out uh, UV light, for instance. These glasses have a UV filter on them, and you can't even see it. I mean, it's so thin. It doesn't take much to stop UV light. Um, and so I don't know how thick the canopy was. It's just a theory. But we do know that water will block out certain things. For instance, the sun produces lots of things besides light. It produces gamma rays, x-rays. A beta rays, all those ray boys come down here and they're pretty hard on your carcass. They will actually destroy your body. It causes a lot of damage. A canopy of water above the atmosphere would prevent that in the pre-flood world. And that things from the sun that are coming down, particularly x-rays, are very dangerous. They go right through your skin. Uh, you go to the hospital to get an x-ray. Of course, they use a higher dose of x-ray than you get from the sun. But you could take x-ray film that they use at the hospital, walk out in the yard, take it out of the box, put it back in, Go inside and develop it. The sunlight produces x-rays. It'll ruin the film if they don't keep it protected. X-rays go right through your body, and they will expose what's inside. X-ray machines, basically they're sending out a blast of zillions, itty-bitty tiny bullets, real small. They go right through you and make a shadow of what's inside. Sort of like a machine gun or a shotgun, blasting you full of holes. And I tell people this is why many radiologists have a negative outlook on life because they look at this kind of stuff all day long. But uh, your skin especially suffers from this, x-rays from the sun. Your skin gets blasted all day long, and you have three basic layers to the skin, the dermis, epidermis, and subcutaneous, where the fat is stored. X-rays go blasting through your skin and blow it full of holes, and your body must fix the damage. And it happens you know, all day. Millions of cells have to be replaced because of damage from the sun. And the more exposure to the sun you get, the more damage you cause to your skin. And after 50 or 60 or 70 years, your skin begins to lose the war. It can't keep up with the damage, and pretty soon everybody starts to notice you are losing the war. As your skin begins to wrinkle up, this is one of the primary causes of uh, aging and wrinkling is this damage from the sun. There's other causes involved, like the damage that's now happening to the plants that we're eating. Not only are we being exposed to sunlight since the flood's been over, being exposed to a different kind of sunlight, we're also, our plants are being exposed to a different kind of sunlight, so they're also not having the nutritional value that they used to have. Anyway, concrete will stop x-rays, lead stops x-rays, and water stops x-rays. Several other things stop them. And if there was a layer of water above the earth before the flood, that would explain why people lived so long. Before the flood, they lived an average of 912 years. That's a long time. It's also one of the quiz questions. What was the average? Uh, it'll be actually be on, end up on the final exam. What was the average lifespan before the flood? These are just, of course, from the dates we have recorded in the Bible. We don't know that this is average of everybody in the world at the time. But the patriarchs, all the people's names given in the Bible, if you simply add them up, the numbers that they give, and they left out Enoch in this average purposely. Enoch uh, never died. So if you want to figure him in there, he's already 6,000 years old. And so it would really up the average, not, not bring it down, since Enoch never died. So they left him out to average the rest of the numbers. It's interesting, when you look at the charts, the things you can learn from this graph are, are fascinating. For instance, Methuselah died the same year that the flood started. There's all sorts of good preaching goes on about this topic. I don't know how much of it is provable, but it's very interesting. Enoch was Methuselah's daddy. Apparently, God told um, these people what to name their children because the names of these ten patriarchs here have a, have a message that it spells out. I forget the, what the message is now, but it's in Henry Morris's book. Uh, it's in the Defender's Bible, as a matter of fact. I should have looked that up before class. But uh, you can get it 
the, the, the ten names have meanings. Methuselah means when he dies, it shall come. Now picture yourself as Enoch. You have a baby boy named, and you don't know what to name him yet. And you and your wife are discussing, what do we name this kid? And the Lord impresses on your heart to name him Methuselah. When he dies, it shall come. So Enoch is holding his baby thinking, Lord, why do you want him named Methuselah? When he dies, what shall come? The end of the world? And so the, the preaching goes, I don't know how true it is, but it sure seems like it you know, could be, that Enoch realized when this boy dies, that's it. God's going to destroy the world. Now, did Enoch know how long his baby was going to live? No. Could have lived, you know, two days. So Enoch apparently got right with God and kept so close to the Lord because he didn't know when his son was going to die. All he knew was when this boy dies, that's it. Because God apparently had told him that in, in order to get this name, Methuselah. So Enoch got so close to the Lord, they're walking and talking one day, and the Lord said, you know, Enoch, we're really closer to my house than yours. I want you to come on home and spend the rest of the day. He said, okay, Lord, and since there's no night there, he's still spending the day up in heaven with the Lord. <laughs> like I said, it preaches good, but we don't know. It also, it's interesting, it shows God's mercy. Which one of the guys listed in the Bible lived the longest? Methuselah. God is long-suffering. He's not willing that any should perish. He gave him plenty of opportunity. So this really shows the mercy of God and his long-suffering. He wanted everybody saved. He kept giving them more and more chances. Methuselah lived the longest of all of them. And finally, God had to bring judgment. And I think America's in that situation. We're about to receive the judgment of God. We sure deserve it if anybody did. Now, there are some people who go around teaching that the reason these numbers are so large before the flood. I just read an article in a book today, yesterday. This guy said, well, they used a lunar calendar. And the next sentence said, they counted every month as a year. So the guy was explaining why they lived to be 900 years old. He said they didn't really live to be 900. You have to divide their age by 12. Well, there are some real problems with that because Enoch was 65 when he begat Methuselah. Two of these guys were 65 when their son was born. And see, divided by 12, he's five and a half when he becomes a daddy. I don't think so, okay? That would be an even bigger miracle than having him live to be 900. So it just simply is crazy to say that this is anything other than really living to be 900 years old. They really were. Probably the reason they were, several reasons. Number one, they would have a pure gene pool. No defective chromosomes. Today, the average person has about 4,000 defective genes. A gene, in case you don't know, is if you took a ladder, an extension ladder from here to Chicago, about 900 miles, and you had somebody stand on the other end while you started twisting it here. You twist it and twist it and twist it and twist it. By the time it gets all twisted up from here to Chicago, what are those things they sell at Taco Bell, the cinnamon twisters, okay? Sort of like that, you know, all twisted up. That would be what's roughly what a chromosome looks like. Your, each cell in your body has 46 of those little chromosomes. The rung of the ladder would be a gene. So the illustration people use is, is a twisted ladder. Pretty tough to draw uh, 2D, what a 3D ladder would look like twisted. But each of these things across here is a rung of the ladder. Each of those is called a gene. The whole thing is called a chromosome or a DNA strand, deoxyribonucleic acid. The same thing is a chromosome, deoxyribonucleic acid. And this thing right across here is one gene, G-E-N-E. -E. Now, when you get regenerated in Christ, you're being regened, totally new person, new genes. That's where the word regenerate comes from from that word gene. Now, that'll preach too. But when during uh, conception for the baby, half of this chromosome comes from the mother and half comes from the father. The problem is it splits down the middle. Now, let's take a ladder that is twisted from here to Chicago. We're going to split it all the way down the middle. It's going to unwind itself. And it's going to get the other half of the ladder from the mother or father depending on what your case may be, and it's going to wind itself back together 
And all those genes are going to line up. Absolutely phenomenal how this can happen. And that's one chromosome. You've got 46 that are doing this. And 46 chromosomes in every cell of your body. So radiation from the sun is one of the things that causes damage to these genes. You often see people at the hospital when they're going to get an x-ray, they will put a lead apron over where the ovaries are on a woman, for instance, because they know the x-ray could damage the chromosomes, could damage the genes for the next generation. Many things can damage this, and so they try to be very sensitive to not create damage to this. But the re one of the reasons they lived to be 900 before the flood was they had a pure gene pool, no, no genetic load. You've got about 4,000 of these genes in your gene code that are defective. Sort of like a computer program where something's wrong. Now, if you marry closer than a first cousin, there's a high probability that you both have a similar gene code, and so you might both have the same defective genes. Now you're asking for trouble as far as deformed children. It's against the law in all but three states to marry closer than a first cousin. You have to marry a second cousin or more farther away in all but three states in America. I won't tell you which the three states are, but drive through them and you'll be able to tell. Uh, the people, <laughs> just, <laughs> I believe that the product of that is called a redneck. Uh, but <laughs> anyway, the uh, people were living long before the flood. They had no defective chromosomes in the original creation, number one. Number two, they had a canopy of water to protect them, to filter out the radiation from the sun. Number three, they're eating a perfect diet. They're also eating food that has been unaffected by any of this harmful stuff. Plus, they're eating food grown in soil that is not depleted at all. Mineral-rich soil. I cannot believe what's happened to me in the last three weeks since I started drinking the mineral water. I've been taking vitamins for years. Okay, Good vitamins, Shackley vitamins. And I still have had trouble. I felt like I was getting arthritis in my left hip and my left knee. I've just been having trouble. And it just hurts you know, when I move it sometime. And a chiropractor friend of mine said, are you taking minerals? I said, well, I guess not. I take all sorts of vitamins. He said, oh, well, your body can't absorb vitamins very well unless you also have these minerals. And so I started drinking this couple ounces of this mineral stuff. To describe it as tasting like weak tea would be uh, an exaggeration. Uh, it doesn't taste real good. Not real bad, but it's just, you know, it's all right. Anyway, I drink it every day. And I just, all I can say is I feel so much better. It is really helping. And I'm not selling the stuff. I'm not trying to sell it. I'm just saying it works. I think in the original creation, they had perfect food supply, perfect atmosphere to breathe, uh, no genetic load. They had probably several reasons why they were living to be 900 years old. And they really were. Plus, they were probably getting bigger. The largest man or tallest man in this century that we know of anyway was Robert Wadlow, who died in 1940. He was five foot six when he was five years old. When he was 12, he was the world's tallest Boy Scout at seven foot four. He finally, when he was 22 years of age, started getting trouble with his knees from his growing so fast. He grew to be eight foot 11 and a quarter, almost nine feet tall. And he had trouble with his knees, and so they made special leg braces for him. And one of the braces rubbed a sore on his ankle, and he got gangrene in the sore and died at age 22. He had a size 37 shoe. There's a life-size statue of him in uh, Alton, Illinois, where he lived, just by St. Louis. There's me standing next to it. And I can stand flat-footed and touch an eight-foot ceiling. I could not touch his chin. There's Robert next to his brother and his dad. He was a big boy. Uh, he weighed 500 pounds. He doesn't look very fat, does he? Just He's a big fella. I think before the flood, they were bigger than that. Now, this is a drawing, not a picture, of a skeleton that was alleged to be found in a coal mine in Italy back in the 1850s, I believe. Now, some of the scoffers have ridiculed this drawing, saying when you find a skeleton, the ribs are not in place. Well, I understand that, okay? The ribs are going to collapse and it's going to be flattened out. They're not going to be up in place like that. This is just a drawing of what they said they found in this coal mine. There are numerous stories and legends about giant skeletons that have been found. And this, this man was supposed to be 11 feet 6 inches tall. Well, long, not tall. He's laying down now. But 11 foot 6. Can you imagine having one of those guys on your basketball team? Whew. 
when you throw the ball to Herman. <laughs> okay, drop it in, Herman. Right there. You could stand on the free throw line and probably drop it in the hoop. They could shoot 100% from the free throw line. I, I, in my seminar, I, I tell the story how some people get upset with me and they say, Now, Mr. Hovind, you said that was the skeleton of a man. Maybe it was a woman. Well, that's a fair question, but I taught biology and anatomy. I happen to know how to tell the difference between a male and female skeleton. It is not the number of ribs. Only Adam was missing a rib. By the way, there's only one bone in the human body that will grow back if it's removed. The low, the bottom rib. The only bone that will regenerate. There's an interesting story in Creation Magazine just a few months ago. If you get from uh, uh, Answers in Genesis, Creation Magazine, about this uh, guy, a doctor who was in a car accident and had smashed, had smashed his face in and they, they were going to rebuild the bones in his face. He went in for surgery many, many times and they kept opening up his side, taking pieces of bone out to use it to graft to rebuild his facial bones. And so this doctor asked his doctor, aren't I going to run out of bone down there or something? You keep going in the same spot to get bone for grafting in my face. He said, no, you know, the only bone that grows back in the whole human body is the lowest rib. <laughs> Interesting bit of trivia. As long as you leave the coating, they're called the periosteum, the rib will grow right back. So, Adam had a rib taken out. That, of course, is not going to affect his gene pool. If you cut your arm off and you have children, will your children be born with no arm? No. And if God took a rib out of Adam, that wouldn't affect his children any. And it's surprising how many people today still believe women have more ribs than men. It just simply is not true, okay? Now, it is true there are people who have one extra set of ribs more than everybody else. See, that happens. It's a genetic thing. You know, sometimes people have 13 ribs, pairs, instead of 12. But it's, pre it's pretty rare, and who cares anyway? But it's not a, it's not a male-female thing, okay? Everybody has the same number of ribs. But there are two ways to tell the difference between a male and female skeleton. One is to look at the feet. If they're pointed toward the mall, it's a woman. <laughs> Don't write that down. That won't be a quiz question. One lady said, no, Mr. Oven, her feet are pointed away from the mall because she died after shopping. That shopping's hard on these women. I said, okay. The second way to tell the difference is to look at the process on what's called the temporal mandibular joint. That's the place where the jawbone, the mandible, hooks onto the skull. If that joint right there is worn out more, it's probably a woman. One lady said, that's because we've got to tell you men everything twice. You don't listen the first time. I said, well, that's, I'm guilty of that too. Uh, but that's just a joke I tell. And that's, I, you'd be surprised. I get letters from time to time or phone calls who get people get upset about jokes in my seminar. I say, look, lighten up, you know. <laughs> First place, I'm just kidding. They say, are you against women? I say, my own mother was a woman. No, I'm not against women. Uh, she comes from a long line of women, matter of fact. Uh, so, no, I'm not against them at all. But uh, there, there are uh, other differences between male and female skeletons. These two are not the ones. But some giant skeletons have been found. That's what I want to talk about tonight. In Indianapolis newspaper, 1975, they quoted an article that was also quoted in Reader's Digest, Mysteries of the Unexplained, where it talks about a giant skeleton, nine foot, eight inch tall. That's pretty big. It was found in Indiana in 1879. And I don't know what became of it. Nobody's been able to trace down what happened to this giant skeleton. I have a theory about that, though, and we will get to that in a minute. A skeleton nearly 10 feet long was found in Humboldt Lake, Nevada. In 1931, 10-foot skeleton up to the ceiling up there. Pretty good size. In Guam, there are some giant stones that are set up over there. And even today, the legend exists in Guam about the, Le the Leyte stones. I think that's how you pronounce it, Leyte, that are found. They said, who put these giant stones up here anyway? They said, oh, the giants that used to live here did that. It's still part of their custom that there were giants in Guam at one time. Giant people. In Walkertown, Indiana, which is up near South Bend, a group of amateur archaeologists opened a mound in 1925 and unearthed the skeletons of eight giants ranging from eight to nine feet long, all wearing heavy copper armor. Through the bungling of the diggers and the disinterest of the muse archaeological museum establishment, these discoveries have now been scattered and lost. Now, the book Weird America by Jim Brandon, which I have in my library here, he goes through talking about some of these giant things that are found and about dinosaurs still living. And then he says, isn't it amazing they survive for millions of years? <laughs> Just 
does good research and gets the wrong conclusion from the whole thing. Uh, Lompoc, California, down in Southern California. I'll be there um, day after tomorrow. In 1883, some soldiers were digging for a magazine, a place to store gunpowder, keep it cool out of the weather. They found a giant skeleton 12 feet tall. The Indians in that area, this was still during the time of a lot of Indians, you know, uh, Indian wars even going on in 1880, um, they got upset because they had disturbed a grave. Now, in many cultures, of course, if you disturb a grave, that's uh, one of the worst taboos there is. You don't bother a grave. And so the remains were reburied, and nobody knows where it is today. But this was reported commonly back in 18. Uh, 80s about this giant skeleton. This is from the book The Unexplained by Dr. Carl Schuker, who is a scientist in England and writes ex extensively about unusual phenomena like this. You must, might also want to contact uh, Todd Jurassic. He's a friend of mine in uh, Oklahoma who does a lot of research on giant skeletons that are found. Skeleton. He's writing a book about it. I've been after him. I say, Todd, he calls once a month or so. I say, finish the book because he's collected enormous amount of material on these giant skeletons, giant humans that are found. A skeleton 12 feet tall was reported in Tucson, Arizona in 1891. The man had six toes, long hair, and a bird-shaped headdress. Where else do you read about six toes in the Bible? Who knows? Who had six, six fingers and six toes? Anybody know? Goliath's brother, or cousin or uncle, or whatever he was, had six toes and six fingers. Often, though not always, six toes is, a, is a, one of the first uh, six toes or six fingers is one of the first uh, symptoms of close inbreeding. First cousin marriage, you know, man marries his aunt or his niece. Uh, not always, but often this is the case. The girl that I told you about um, that rode our bus in um, Illinois had sickle cell anemia. Her mother and father were brother and sister. The nine-year-old raped his eight-year-old sister, and she got pregnant and had a child, and that little child rode our bus. A great, great girl. Uh, she died of, at 13 of sickle cell anemia, but she had six fingers on each hand. This is not always the case, but it is one of the symptoms that sometimes showed up. It shows up with extra extra digits. This happens with cats all the time. Cats often marry back to their own family. How many have ever seen a cat with six or seven toes? Ever seen that? I saw one with nine one time. Cats had toes sticking out every place. Cat was. Well, cats are schizo anyway, but this one was extra schizo. Something was wrong. <laughs> Something was wrong with that cat. That is a redneck cat. But uh, <laughs> I've got several books in my library if you want to read more about this. Uh, uh, these giants that are found. Here's the references at the bottom. There's a whole series of books by David Hatcher Childress. Um, you might want to get write that phone number down and get a hold of them. That's the one where this article comes from. If you want to get, we'll get into this in a second. But to 815. This is uh, south of Chicago, Kankakee area. 815-253-9000. And they do research on, it's called World Explorer Magazine. Now, they're not Christians necessarily, but they just do incredible research on strange things that are found around the world that nobody wants to talk about because they don't fit the what's called the paradigm, you know, the way you're supposed to believe. But they go and visit these places and do research on it. It's really, really good stuff. They've got a book called Far Out Adventures. I'll bring that after the break. I've got it here. Heidi, the ones you cut the pages out, I handed it to somebody to bring out here tonight, and it didn't make it, so it must be still on my desk. But um, That's put out by these folks about some of these giant skeletons and other strange things. They get into all sorts of things, UFOs and you know, a variety of things like that. Um, there's a website which you can get about this topic, uh, geocities.com, which is a web host for all sorts of things. But geocities.com slash the tropics slash lagoon slash 1345 slash giants has uh, information about some of the giant skeletons. This article we passed out here from uh, Far Out Adventures magazine is one of the back issues about what the Smithsonian has done for hiding, uh, hiding information about these giants. When a giant skeleton is found, the Smithsonian often will come to investigate and they'll say, oh, this is interesting. We'll take this back and study it. And they take it back and you never hear from it again. It's reported in here, i got several things in here, that an entire barge full of artifacts was taken out in the ocean and dumped from the Smithsonian. The Smithsonian, some of the directors seem to have an agenda. They want to make sure everybody believes in evolution. 
Now, I think there's a bigger picture. If we can step back and look at the whole thing. Satan wants to control this world. The Bible teaches God made the world. Now, if you get a bunch of people together who believe God made the world, they believe they have rights that came from God. Those people don't make good slaves. Eventually, they will throw the tea in the harbor and rebel against the king, right? Like our founding fathers did, because they had a philosophy. They said, we hold these truths to be self-evident. All men are created equal. And people who believe in creation oftentimes get this attitude of, you know, I'm going to answer to God, and I don't care what anybody else thinks. I'm going to try to please God. Now, if somebody wants a one-world government or a new world order, they can't have people believing they have rights that come from God. You have to get everybody to believe that your rights come from the government. And so evolution is a foundation philosophy for communism, socialism, Marxism, Nazism. If you want people to believe government is supreme, evolution goes along with that attitude. But if you want people to believe that God is supreme and laws come from God, then creation is the foundation for that thinking. And I believe there are many folks in this country in high places with lots of money who really want a one-world government. They have most of the money. They would like the rest of it. And so they want everybody to be their slaves. And they want to be the elite and we will be the rice farmers, those that they allow to live, you know, however many that's going to be, whatever they need. you know. And so there's a real strong push among some of these institutions like Smithsonian, and probably everybody that works there doesn't know this and maybe doesn't care, but there are certainly some who would say, look, we want, a, we want people to believe in evolution theory. This is the world view we're going to push. And anything that goes against this theory, we'll just have to you know, get rid of that information. Now, evolution teaches man started off itty-bitty and we're evolving and getting bigger and better and stronger. Isn't that what the theory teaches? You find a 12-foot skeleton... What does that do to your theory? It shoots it down. Suppose the opposite of evolution is true. Suppose we were made in God's image. Suppose, let's just suppose now, okay? Suppose Adam and everybody back here was 12 feet tall. If you're 12 feet tall, how fast could you run? In a perfect environment, 30% oxygen, perfect food supply. You don't need a car. You run to grandma's house, right? Of course, they didn't have a grandma either, but uh, it was it was just or a mother-in-law either. That's why it was paradise. But uh, no, actually, my wife has a great mother-in-law. Uh, but I think uh, the time before the flood was just a lot different. They probably were huge back then. And you can take this home and read it. For those of you watching the tapes, of course, I'm not going to make a copy for you. You have to get your own book from the World Explorer magazine. Keeping in mind, it's not a Christian organization. It's just fascinating research on giant things or unusual things that kind of just disappear when they get in the Smithsonian, you know, the attic of the ba of the nation, it's called, and they, they disappear for sure. Right now, in Lovelock, uh, Nevada, in Lovelock Cave, in 1931, or 1911, I'm sorry, they found this giant human skull. The person that had this skull would have probably been 10 feet tall, assuming normal body proportions. The skull is still there on display in Winnemucca, Nevada. If you're ever driving, driving across Nevada, stop in because there's nothing else to see when you drive across Nevada. You might as well stop in Winnemucca if you get close. But there's this massive human skull. Your second bone down in your thumb, all these bones are called phalanges in your fingers and thumb. The second one down is shown right here on this picture. On top is a normal size human phalange, thumb bone. Underneath, Ron Wyatt, a friend of mine, who died about a year ago, he is holding a giant human thumb bone. This giant human thumb bone was one of part of an entire skeleton, obviously. This was found right near Mount Ararat. Now, Ron told me the whole story before he died. You can call Richard Reeves. Uh, see, phone number right there. Richard took over for Ron when he died. Richard's number is 931-486-0557. And listen to the story. But Ron said that they were exploring around the area where Noah's Ark is in Turkey. He's been over there bunches of times doing research over there about Noah's Ark. And they found this large stone. It was very, very faded, but they could make out an image on there. He said there were two stones, apparently gravestones. One of the stones 
had what looked like a boat carved in there with a bow over the top of it, apparently symbolizing the rainbow over Noah's Ark. Walking away from the boat, there were two big people and six small people. One of the big people had their eyes closed. So they assume this is symbolism for this is the grave of one of the big people on Noah's Ark. The other tombstone had both of the big people's eyes closed. So they're assuming, hey, this is Noah's grave, this is Mrs. Noah's grave. Now, in that culture, Islamic, you don't disturb a grave. But they did. They dug it up. The coffin was over 12 feet long. The skeleton inside was 12 feet tall, assuming it was Mrs. Noah. Uh, inside were all sorts of jewels. Apparently, pre-flood jewels. This seems reasonable anyway. The mayor of the city over there that was with on this expedition, they, you know, they covered the grave back up and didn't disturb anything. When Ron went back several years later, the gravestone had been smashed and the coffin was gone and the jewels were all gone. And so all they can surmise is that somebody in the government over there, you know, decided to go become rich. Ron dug around in the dirt and did find a few more of the bones that apparently when they moved the skeleton, some of the bones, you know, fell apart. Here's one of the thumb bones right there. This person would have been probably 12 feet tall. People say, you think one man and three boys built that big boat for the flood? Oh yeah, the Bible says they did. Of course, they could have hired help too, you know, people work for heathens and lost. heathen work for lost, save people all the time and vice versa. But some people say, well, three, one man and three boys couldn't build a boat that big. Well, you didn't see those boys. They would have been big too, right? Now, let's assume Noah was 12 feet tall. Let's just assume for the sake of argument. Now, what would that do to his cubit? How big would his cubit be? Now, we don't know the size of the ark. It could be when Moses edited the book of Genesis, Moses would translate it, if that's the right word, into what he thought was a the modern English or modern unit of measurement. For instance, if I was going to translate uh, an ancient document from 2,000 years ago and they're talking about shekels, it would make sense for me to write it in English as dollars and cents, right? So it could be that Moses edited Genesis and he, used, he might have used what's called the Egyptian cubit, which was 20.6 inches. My cubit happens to be very close to that, 21 inches. 20.6 inches is an Egyptian cubit. The standard Hebrew cubit seems to be 18 inches. Everybody's cubit is slightly different, but that's, uh, who cares? Anyway, uh, the arc, arc might have been really big. This thigh bone, let's see. Uh, John, would you grab that off the table over there? I'm wired in here. This is a replica of a thigh bone that was given to me. Joe Taylor, his phone number there, he makes the castings of this thing. That's good, just bring it up right there, yeah. And if you see over there in the corner is the drawing of what the guy would have looked like. This is the thigh bone, it's upside down here, from a giant skeleton that was found when a road construction crew was digging with bulldozers across part of Egypt. They think they went across an ancient battlefield. They don't know. There's all kinds of skeletons out there. This guy would have been about 13 feet tall, if proportions hold true. I can't vouch for what happened to the originals. That's good, Jan, thank you. Um, but that's a good size thigh bone. Here's Joe Taylor, the guy who makes the castings of it, standing next to it, telling about it. Egyptian construction crew ran into a burial ground and found several burials of giant humans, some 16 feet tall. I was asked to sculpt a model based on one femur. The size femur would have belonged to a man 16 feet tall. The Bible tells of giants before and after the flood. Goliath was nine foot Actually, Goliath must, he was, the Bible says he was six cubits and a span. Well, a cubit is at least a foot and a half. That's the small cubit. Six of those is nine feet, and a span is nine inches. So if Goliath was nine foot and nine, then the Bible says Og, King Og, was somewhere between 12 and 18 feet tall because the Bible says Og's bed was, I forget how many cubits it gives, but you can look up Og in the Bible. Either he just liked having a big bed or he was really a big fella. But he would have been pretty big, and this was after the flood. Giant skeletons have been found in Texas, Arizona, Europe, Ohio, and in the Bible lands. There are giant bones in rocks supposed to be hundreds of millions of years old. That's the problem, is that stupid evolution theory that hinders people from doing research. Here's a kid standing next to the replica of the thigh bone here that was found in Egypt. In Turkey, giant skeletons are on, giant jaw bones are on display right now. 
Ron said they wouldn't let him open the case to take the jawbones out and look at them because they don't want people handling these things. This may be from Noah's grave or Mrs. Noah's grave. We don't know. But across what's called the TMJ, the temporal mandibular joint, where your jaw attaches, average human is probably about three and a half inches. That's the width of your jawbone across the joints. This was six and a half inches. Any one of us could put your head inside the jaw and rattle it back and forth. This would be a giant person. We would assume, or else they had a huge jawbone, one or the other. Up in Wasaukee, Wisconsin, I went up there and met Mrs. Ailes. She owns the resort where some giant bones were found. This is in Wisconsin. We'll talk about that right after the break when we get back. Talk about some more of the giants that are found. Let's take a few-minute break here. Let's finish up talking about some of the giants that are found uh, from apparently pre-flood times and probably shortly after the flood. I was up in Wisconsin. I heard about this article in the newspaper back in 1904 of a giant, uh, several giant skeletons that were found inside an Indian burial mound. So I was driving right past Wausaukee, Wisconsin, one day uh, last year, and so I decided to stop and see, you know, chase it down, see what I could do. It's been uh, 1904. It's been you know nearly 100 years. But I found the place where these Indian, mound, Indian mounds were. They're now underwater. You can just see the tops of them sticking out above the water. They built a dam and filled this valley in with uh, Fritza Lake. The person that owns the property where this was was Mrs. Ailes. Now, she is 94 years old. So she was born just a couple years after this was found by her father, I believe, is the one who found these giant skeletons. Here's what the newspaper article says. Near the outlet of Lake Nockabee, which is where Mrs. Ailes' resort is now, in northeast Wisconsin, mounds were found containing hundreds of skeletons. One skull was about three times the size of the ordinary human, and other bones were correspondingly big. Now, this is an article from 1904. So I stopped, found Mrs. Ailes. She's 94 years old, still runs her own uh, resort there. People rent cabins, you know, to come go fishing on the lake. I said, Mrs. Ailes, what's the story about these giant bones found on your property. She said, oh, come with me, I'll show you. We went out in the front yard, the lakeside. She said, you see that the little island right there? I said, yep. She said, that's the top of an Indian mound, apparently Indian, it's the top of a mound anyway. That's where the bones were found. I said, what happened to them? She said, you know, my dad gave it to a doctor, gave the giant skull to a doctor, um, and his widow is still alive. She's 104 or 5 years old. She's in a nursing home. Uh, apparently, the dad kept this giant skull for a while because she, has, she said she had seen it, this giant human skull. And then when, as I don't know how many years later it was, he gave it to this doctor. And she said, I don't know what the, his widow's done with it. She's in the nursing home. I'll ask her next time I see her. <laughs> 104 years old. I haven't heard back. That's the last I heard. But there's Mrs. Ailes' phone number. You can call it up and check it out for yourself. But this was a story reported in, from here in, up in Wisconsin about giant human skeletons were found. The Bible says there were giants in the earth in those days. Now, what factors would cause them to grow to be 10 or 12 or 14 feet tall, I don't know. But I know a lot of the footprints that are found in rock, the human footprints like the ones in Glen Rose, Texas, that are found with dinosaur tracks, the footprints are huge, 16 inches long. Some of them 24 inches long. Shaquille O'Neal is a pretty good-sized basketball player. His shoe is a size 22, so it would be, I don't know, about yay long. Um, mine is a size 10 and a half. You know, I'm 6'1", size 10 and a half shoe. Shaquille is a size 22. Um, I've met people that have size 18 shoes. I'll show you some pictures of those in the next class when we get to that point about the uh, giant human uh, skeletons. We'll get a little more into the giant insects and giant animals that are found. But the time before the flood is probably the time when these giants lived. The Bible teaches us that we are made in God's image. It's pretty clear. Genesis chapter 1, God said, I'm going to make man in my image. Now, there's all sorts of arguments about what does this mean. Does this mean God have a body, has a body like we do? No, that's not what that means. The Bible teaches very clearly that God is a spirit, and they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. Uh, John chapter 4. So this is probably a moral likeness. We have a consciousness of right and wrong. There's a, you know, I was on a radio, uh, two radio programs this afternoon just before class, and uh, one of the things that comes up is, you know, uh, 
if evolution is true, how do you determine right from wrong? Where's the standard? If we were going to build this room, and I got all you guys and said, okay, I want you to help me build this, build this room, and I gave everybody a ruler, but all of them were different standards. On yours, this is an inch. On yours, this is an inch. On yours, this is an inch. On yours, we have a regular inch. If everybody had a different standard of what an inch was, or a meter, if we all had different standards, how would this room turn out if we're all working together to try to build it? <laughs> Not too good, would it? <laughs> Wouldn't be good at all. You have to have a standard, even if it's wrong, just so you all have the same standard, just something to go by. And the problem is, America has lost the standard for determining right from wrong. How do you tell right from wrong? Think about it. If evolution is true, how do you tell what's wrong and right? We used to have a standard we went by called, Thus saith the Lord. But we've lost that. We've left that. We haven't lost it. We left it. The standard for determining right from wrong. People say, do you think abortion's right or wrong? I say, well, let me ask you a question. Do you believe in creation or evolution? Because that's going to determine how you make your other decisions. Is murder right or wrong? Well, do you believe in creation or evolution? Because that's really where it's going to start. If you believe in evolution, I'd like to know how you have how do you determine right from wrong? If evolution is true, why do people have a conscience? Why do we have love and justice and mercy and would those emotions evolve? Does a lion feel bad when he kills the zebra and eats them? No, he's glad. He's going to do it again, right? Plans to. Why don't the why doesn't the animal world develop these feelings of 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 pity and you know emotions like that? If evolution is true, I mean, if evolution is really true, then no humans should be alive today that have feelings of love and justice and mercy and pity. Shouldn't even, they shouldn't have survived. That should have been weeded out a long time ago. So this verse about being made in the image of God, I think is talking about a moral likeness. There's whole sermons, there's whole books just on this, you know, what does this verse mean about the image of God. But here, the Bible teaches we're made in God's image, and the textbooks teach the kids, this is grandpa. Right? How many of you learned about cavemen when you were in school, about us coming from an ape-like creature of some kind? So what about these cavemen? The kids are taught this in school. They thought we came from an ape-like ancestor. Is it possible for an ape to turn to a human? Somebody, somebody sent me that email and I just uh, <coughs> couldn't resist throwing that in there. Let's uh, talk just briefly about the cavemen. There's so much more that needs to go into this topic. I mean, their whole course is going to be taught just on this. We'll take a little quick trip down Evolution's Hall of Shame. Nebraska man is a good place to start. You know, all they really found for a Nebraska man was one tooth. A guy named Harold Cook in Sioux County, Nebraska, which borders Colorado, he found a tooth. That was it. One tooth. He said it looked to him like it was halfway between the shape of a human tooth and an ape's tooth. So therefore, it proves it came from an animal that was halfway between a human and an ape. This is the line of logic they use now, okay? They built the entire skeleton for the museum around this one tooth. They said, well, if the tooth is shaped like this, you know, the jaw must be shaped like this. And if the jaw is like that, you know, that would fit a head like this. And if the head like that, you know, then it fit the body. <laughs> they built, built the entire thing from one tooth. Then they made the guy a wife. you got to really be good to know what his wife looks like from the shape of his tooth. But they had him on display. London Illustri Illustrated London News, 1922. Nebraska man, proof for evolution. During the Scopes Monkey Trial in 1925 in Dayton, Tennessee, they were going to bring in a bunch of witnesses as to, get, to give proof for evolution. It turned out the judge said, it doesn't matter what evidence you have for evolution, this is not what's on trial. The only question is, did the teacher break the law? The law in Tennessee says you can't teach evolution. So I don't want you bringing in evidence for evolution. That doesn't matter whether there's evidence for it. The question is, did he break the law? That was the question. 
So even though these evolutionists had these grandiose plans of making a big deal out of proof, using this case to bring all their evidence for evolution in, the judge disallowed anything. He said, I don't care about the evidence for evolution. It doesn't matter because that's not what's on trial here. But one of the things they were working very hard and preparing to bring in as evidence was Nebraska man. The American Museum of Natural History in New York, the director at the time was Henry Fairfield Osborne, who was a racist through and through. And we'll get in a lot more of his quotes later when we get into seminar part uh, uh, five, if we ever get that far. But the, the racism that evolution, that evolution breeds. Um, Osborne was one of the guys who went around promoting this as proof for evolution. Nebraska man is proof for evolution. Here we have the proof right in your hands. How can you not believe it? It was a tooth. Later they found out the tooth really came from a peccary, a pig. There's the real Nebraska man right there, folks. It was a pig's tooth. I had an evolutionist get all upset with me and said, don't you know there's a difference between a peccary and a pig? Well, look at them both side by side. Okay, the peccary's still alive in South America, running around doing just fine. Okay, I know there's a minor difference, but they're a very similar animal. Okay, let's look at Piltdown Man. In 1912, an amateur archaeologist named Dawson and a French Catholic priest who loved the evolution theory named Pierre de Chardin, he had a longer name than that, and all those French always have eight names, you know, but he had a real long name. Anyway, and a guy named Woodward, and who, nobody's for sure who's involved in this, but who, who made this happen. But they were looking for evidence for evolution. Now, if you get somebody who's determined he wants to find evidence for his theory, he's eventually going to find some evidence for his theory, even if he has to interpret what he finds in the light of his theory, which is probably what everybody does. I, we're all guilty of that, okay? Which is why you have to have other people check your work and say, hey, here's where you're wrong. Sorry about that. Well, this uh, Catholic priest, Pierre de Chardin, and these other guys were digging around in this gravel pit looking for the missing link. Now, keep in mind, in the early 1900s, evolution theory had been out for 60 years. Darwin had predicted, we're going to find evidence for my theory. It had been 60 years since Darwin's theory came out, and there was still no evidence. So they started getting pretty desperate. And so people were looking for proof for this theory. And so probably Woodward or the Catholic priest Pierre de Chardin uh, took a human skull, just a skull cap, the top part of the skull, and the jawbone from an orangutan, an ape. They broke off the places where they would normally fit together, where the hinges go together. They broke those off because they'd be real obvious they didn't go together if they were those were pieces were on there. So they broke off the important pieces. They stained them with... Uh, First, they treated them with acid to make them look old and pitted, stained them with uh, some kind of chemical to make them look old, and went out and buried them in the gravel pit, close to each other. They went out fossil hunting a few days later, and guess what they found? Oh, look at this. Wow. Proof for evolution. They planted it themselves, apparently. This came to be known as the Piltdown Man, because it was from Piltdown, which is near England. or It's in England. It's near London, England. The Piltdown Commons, I believe. It was a gravel pit. Piltdown Man was in the textbooks for 40 years. All the kids for 40 years were taught, we've got proof for evolution from the Piltdown Man. If you'd went to school, if you had gone to school in the 1930s or 1940s or early 1950s, your textbook would have said, Evolution is true, and here's the evidence for it. And Piltdown Man would have been one of the things you'd have to learn and study and memorize. 1953, it was exposed as a fraud. See, here's the problem. When they get these cavemen, somebody will find the bones. They will reassemble it, what they think it looked like, because the bones are usually pretty broken up. I believe, for instance, Lucy... The skull of Lucy had 200 pieces. Talk about a jigsaw puzzle. First place, you're not even sure you have all the pieces. Try to put together a puzzle like that. Um, but they put together the Piltdown hoax. It was a deliberate fraud. Broke off the important pieces so they would, wouldn't discover the fraud. Then they made castings of those pieces. Make a replica. Now, the replicas go out to museums all over the world. 
the real bones are kept locked in a vault where nobody can even look at them. Probably none of you in this room have ever met anybody who has seen the original bones. They lock them up like they're you know, more important than gold in Fort Knox. Of course, there's no gold in Fort Knox anymore either. That's another long story. But um, The replicas went all over the place. Replicas of uh, Piltdown Man. Everybody studied these replicas and said, wow, this is, you're right, you know. There were 500 papers. I used to say there were 500 doctoral dissertations. That's not quite correct. There were 500 research papers, some just for master's degrees or other papers, that were written about the Piltdown fossils. People studied the replicas and said, yep, this goes together. This is proof for evolution and wrote a paper and the paper gets published someplace and therefore now they can say, look, there's 500 articles published about this. It has to be true. Well, somebody got the brilliant idea to go study the original fossils. Wow, what a novel idea. Looking at them under the microscope, they discovered the teeth had been filed down. There were file marks on the teeth. The more they studied the originals, the more they realized these don't even go together. Then in the early 50s, they developed another kind of test to test uh, bones. I think it's fluoride something. Bones absorb fluoride out of the ground. I could look up the name of the test. But to see how old they were. They found out the skull cap was probably 800 years old, maybe from a battle back, you know, 800 years ago. England had battles all the time over there, everybody beating each other with their swords and spears. And so they got this skull cap, probably about 800 years old, they guessed, and the jawbone was probably less than 100 years old, and it was from an orangutan. Now, see, the, the shape of the skull of a human is more rounded as opposed to the monkey skull, which is a very distinctive shape. And if you find a big enough piece of a skull, a good anthropologist can tell you quickly if it's from a human or from an ape. So this was an obviously human skull cap and an obviously ape-like jaw. See, the human jaw is rounded, whereas ape's jaws is more pointed, kind of like a St. Louis arch or a parabola. Um, and so one of the things they go by for determining, uh, this is the shape roughly of a human lower jaw. Your teeth will line up you know, in this configuration, whereas an ape's is more elongated, like that. And this was an obvi obviously an ape-like um, jaw, but an obviously human skull. And so they said, wow, this, this is evolution. And this is where they got the idea that probably the brain evolved into human first before speech evolved. Oh, this is proof, all right. You know, what more can you ask for? <laughs> They're so desperate to make that theory true because that's the only way to get rid of God. Well, it turned out to be a fraud. This article here from Reader's Digest 1956 explained you know, more about this Piltdown hoax if you want to get that article. I went to quite a few libraries looking for this article. I found many libraries that have Reader's Digest that go all the way back you know, long ways. I forget how many exactly, but quite a few of the libraries I went to when I got the October 56 Reader's Digest issue down, opened it up, those pages had been cut out. They were gone. Interesting. Now, I don't know if it's a conspiracy or what, but uh, they were gone. I can tell you that. <laughs> Finally, somebody sent me an original 1956 Reader's Digest, which I have in my library here. It's the article about the, uh, the Piltdown hoax. But I suspect, of course, if somebody wants evolution to be believed, then you know you don't want evidence against it out there. So there are probably some people who don't like this at all. Neanderthal man is one more that's in the textbooks. He's still in there today. Neanderthal, the name comes from the Neander Valley, named after some guy named, uh, I believe it was Joseph Neander. There's a famous song that we have in our songbooks. Uh, I should have looked that up. Somebody can find that and write to me. I'll add it to my next time I teach this class. But Neander Valley was named after this uh, Christian in Germany who uh, loved the Lord and wrote a beautiful song that's in our songbooks today. If you look in your songbooks and you see the name Neander, Jacob or jo Johann Neander, maybe it was. I don't know. It's a German name, I believe. But this name, valley is named after him. In this valley, they found some bones of a human. The back was bent over. So they said, oh, look, his back's bent over. Now, of course, most people know that humans walk on two legs and man, apes walk on four. Because of the way they walk, the way their skeleton is, is positioned normally, this makes a great difference in their backbones. 
The vertebrae in your back, for instance, in between every vertebrae, there's a cartilage pad, a disc, okay? Because your backbone is under pressure this way most of the time, each of the bones is dished out to keep that pad in the center. If an animal normally walks with what's called a horizontal backbone, like an elephant or a dog, their backbone is this direction, there, you'll find the, the, the facets of their, the, flats, the parts where their backbones come together is flat. I have, for instance, some mammoth vertebrae and some whale vertebrae. Now, both of those would have a horizontal backbone, and the vertebrae are flat on the places where they come together because they're not under compression this way. They're under strain this way from the flexing. Who cares? Uh, apes walk on four legs. This changes two things. This changes the configuration of their backbone. It also changes the place where the nerve from the backbone enters the head. If you're walking upright, your head is perpendicular to your backbone. So the hole going into your skull is in a different position than an ape or a dog or most any other animal that walks on four legs. The hole where the brain stem goes in is farther back, the position of this hole into the head. And so they can tell by the shape, by the position of the hole into the head, roughly how the person's head was attached. Now, I've seen some people that, that this, their normal standing position is with their head way out here. Right? Uh, not kyphosis. Yeah, kyphosis. Head drifted forward like that. Um, so I'm sure even, if, even among people, there's a great range of where the hole is going into your skull. Uh, but Neanderthal man was listed as a missing link because the back was curved over. Well, they found out about 50 years ago it's because he had arthritis. That's why his back is curved over. It wasn't a part human, part ape. It had arthritis. It was deformed by a disease of some kind or rickets. But Neanderthal man is still in the textbooks today. Now, there's an excellent book if you want to get into the study of the caveman, and I recommend you do that if you're going to be a testimony to other people. We sell this book through our ministry called uh, Buried Alive by Jack Cuazzo. Jack Cuazzo is a dentist in, uh, I believe, New Jersey. He lives up in New England area, or northeast someplace. Um, he went to France and Germany and studied the original bones. Not many folks do that. Most people study the replicas of the bones. He studied all of them. His life was threatened many times because the stuff he was finding out was that this thing, these things that we're saying are evidence for evolution are just deformed humans. Humans deformed from disease. His entire book is just about the Neanderthals. It's not about all the other so-called cavemen, just the Neanderthals, and it's very fascinating reading about the things that happened to him as they did research on the Neanderthals. He said, for instance, he examined the famous Rhodesia man or Broken Hill man, the Neanderthal skull. Dr. Coazzo said, you must understand this skull really cries out disease. The teeth are badly decayed. The bones of the vault of the skull are extremely thick. There are many features that testify of acromegaly or excessive, excessive secretion of growth hormone in adulthood. As a person gets older, several things happen. Their ears start to get longer. Anybody notice that? On older people, their ears get longer and their nose gets bigger. This is because the glands are continually producing this hormone that causes these things to happen. Acromegaly. Some people get it really, really bad. Excessive secretion of this hormone. The thickening of the bones in the forehead and the eyebrow ridge getting thicker is one of the symptoms of a person getting older. If a person passes 90 or 100 years of age, their bones get thicker in the head. They really do get thick-headed. Now, after the flood, how long were they living? 400 years, right? What happened to these people that died after the flood? They probably got buried, right? I mean, what did they do with Noah when he died? They buried him, right? Isn't that normal? So it could be that what they're finding, these skeletons with thicker bones in the head, could be people that are living to be three or 400 years old, post-flood, See, the pre-flood people were probably buried and dissolved, destroyed, you know. Probably wouldn't find very many of those bones at all. Some people have asked, well, hey, if there's a whole a worldwide flood, why don't we find more human bones? I think there's several reasons for that. We get into a lot more of that on video number seven, the question-answer video. But for one thing, when God made the world, it was full of plants, full of animals, and only two people. 
1,600 years later, it's still full of plants and still full of animals and still not full of people. So there's probably a lot more animals to be drowned than there were people to be drowned. Secondly, let's suppose that the people before the flood were 12 feet tall, just for the sake of the argument. You're going out looking for bones, but you believe in evolution. Because of your belief in evolution, you believe everybody in the past was three feet tall, right? You've already got this preconceived idea that says man is evolving and getting bigger and better. So you're digging around in the dirt and you find part of a bone that is gigantic. It would never enter your mind that it might be part of a human bone because of your preconceived idea. You would assume it must be from a, a giant sloth or a cave bear or a dinosaur or something. Okay? There's no telling how many bones have been misidentified because of the preconceived idea of evolution. As opposed to doing research from a creation perspective when things start to make a lot more sense. Um, I'd recommend you get this if you want to get into the Neanderthal study at all. Uh, it's a fascinating book on the Neanderthals. They still list him today in the textbooks as one of the proofs for evolution when it's just a normal human deformed by disease. The brains were actually bigger than ours. Now, they can tell from the bone about how big the person's muscles are. The more you work out with your muscles, the more it puts pressure on the bones, and it actually the bones grow larger. Bodybuilders not only get bigger muscles, they get bigger bones. Take a look. No. <laughs> But the pressure of the muscle pulling on the bone will cause it to enlarge at that point. The body sends a message to the brain, hey, this muscle's pulling pretty hard, I need some more bone down here. And so the bone sends a message down, or the brain sends a message down to grow more bone. And so by studying the size of Neanderthal bones, they've determined the head, the brain was larger than ours, about 1600 cc cubic centimeter average. And they were incredibly strong. It has been said the average Neanderthal could probably pick up the average NFL linebacker and throw him over the goalpost. Unbelievably strong. About 5 foot 10, I believe, was the average height, somewhere in there, for the Neanderthals. But just massively built, really strong people. Now, their eyebrow ridge was different than ours. Of course, you could, if, if you could put a suit and tie on a Neanderthal and walk him down the street, nobody would look twice. He would look just like us. And all you got to do is drive around Pensacola and you'll see some strange shaped skulls on people, right? You could line up the folks in this room and probably prove something, right? <laughs> if you're determined to prove something. So I'd recommend you get and read more on that study. I wish we had time to go on into other stuff. There's a lot more cavemen. In the next course, we'll teach another 10-week course on this. We'll finish up about the cavemen and the Garden of Eden, what it was like. Not only were the people living longer, the animals were living longer, and the uh, fish were living longer. Everything was much larger before the flood. We'll get into more of that in the next course. But um, I think that we've got um, the wrong idea in our textbooks. We're teaching the kids that man used to be small, and he's evolving and getting bigger, when all the evidence is quite the opposite. And there are some folks like Smithsonian and some professors in universities who don't want kids to be exposed to any evidence against their theory. And so there is a real battle going on. And I hope you enjoy uh, studying all that. If you have some people who've gone to anthropology class at the university and they've been taught evolution, you might want to get them this book, uh, Buried Alive, or another one we'll get into next time called Bones of Contention, which is a tremendous book about all of the so-called cavemen. It's got a chapter on Neanderthals and a chapter on Lucy and a chapter on other ones, but uh, we'll get into that later. We offer that through our ministry. Okay, God made a perfect world. Why? Well, he must have wanted our fellowship or something. I don't know. He wants us to love him. But he gave man a free choice. He had to do that, I think. Of course, God doesn't have to do anything, but I believe he did that because he could have made us robots, right? He could have made us like a computer or a tape recorder. You can speak into a tape recorder. I love you, I love you, I love you, and play it back. I love you, I love you, I love you. Ah. Oh. Thank you, thank you. <laughs> Doesn't mean anything, does it? You know, my wife is five foot tall. I'm six one. I can come home and grab her around the throat and say, you tell me you love me. Well, what's her choice, you know? <laughs> it doesn't mean anything, though, does it? 
It's a lot better when I come home and she says, Hi, dear. I sure love you. Wow. See, she doesn't have to. She wants to. And we don't have to serve God. You, if you don't want to serve God, you don't have to. He's not going to make you. He gave you a free choice. Now, when we do decide to serve God, ah, now that means something. So if he would have just said, everybody serve God. Well, okay, he could have done that, programmed us. But I think it was wise for him to give us that freedom of choice. And they chose the wrong thing. They chose to disobey. So then the curse came into the world. The Bible doesn't talk much about the curse, but there was a curse when things began to change, you know. And then that messed up the world. Then you have a flood which really messes up the world. That destroyed things big time. And a lot of people are looking at the world today and assuming this is the same way it looked to Adam and Eve. Totally wrong idea. They had a very different world, probably very different looking sky, very different looking plant life, much larger animals, and probably much larger people. And we're going into all that next course. God made the world, man wrecked it, but in his mercy and his love, God decided to come down in the form of a man and die on the cross to pay for our sins. And 2,000 years ago, Jesus was born and grew up, lived a perfect life, died on the cross to pay for my sins and yours. And if you'll accept that payment that he made, your sins can be forgiven. You can be regened. You can be made a new person. Regenerated. So 1969, February 9th, I said, Lord, I'm a sinner. I'd like you to forgive me and save me. And he made a brand new person. The problem is, he left the old person there too. So there are now two Kent Hovens that live in this body. There's the one that wants to do everything wrong, and there's the one that wants to do everything right. And they fight all the time. <laughs> and whichever one I feed the most generally wins. That's a decision you'll have to make too. First, you've got to make sure you got the Lord in your heart. If you're not saved, you ought to give your heart to Jesus and get saved. After that, it's your job to feed that new, the new person and starve the old person. Paul said, I die daily. Every day you've got to crucify that old man, the flesh, that wants to do everything wrong. One quick illustration and we'll quit. Suppose your kitchen sink was broken. Water is squirting every place. You call me up. Brother Hovind, my sink is broken. You know how to do plumbing? Oh, man, I've done a lot of plumbing. I, I love it. i got the tools. I'll be right over. So I grab my toolbox, run over, knock on the door, and you say, Oh, Brother Hovind, I'm so glad you're here. Man, that sink, the kitchen's a mess. The water's going every place. But listen, uh, I haven't had time to clean the house, Brother Hovind. I really don't want you to come in. Uh, can you stay outside and fix it for me? Uh, no. <laughs> The first thing you have to do, you have to let me in, right? Now, as soon as you let me in, does that mean it is fixed? No, but that means I can start working on it, right? Now, when I'm working on it, you have two choices. You can help me, you know, hold the flashlight, hand me the tools, whatever. Or you can make life more difficult for me, can't you? Turn the water back on, you know, steal my tools, <laughs> slam the cabinet door or something, you know. Once you get Jesus into your heart, that doesn't mean everything fixed, but it means he can start working on it. And so, 1969, I said, Lord, I'd like you to come in and save me. And he did. It doesn't mean everything's fixed, but it means he's in there working. And now I've got a choice to help him out, you know, or to make it harder on him. His goal is to make me like Jesus. Oh, he's got a long ways to go, but he's, he's, he's patient. He's still working on it, okay? <laughs> That's his goal for you, too. And he's going to take you to heaven one day and finish the job. He which hath begun a good work in you will perform it. He will finish the job. Some of God's children, he takes them home and crowns them. Others, he crowns them and takes them home. <laughs> oh, a child of God, huh? you're not acting like one. Why don't you come on home up here? I keep a better eye on you, you know, and take you on home to heaven. So I think that's what happens. Okay, we'll get into much more about the creation later. It looks like at the rate we're going, this course is going to be... Um, several more courses before we finish the whole seminar. I want you to feel free to ask any questions you have. You folks watching the videotape, uh, feel free to call. I get lots of emails and letters. It's much faster if you just pick up the phone and call. I'm usually in the office Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, and we'll be glad to take your call and answer any questions I can. Thank you so much. Hope you had a good time in the course.